In this presentation, we're going to show you how the lattice Dirac operator is constructed. In order to understand the structure of this operator, which we usually represent mathematically as a two-dimensional matrix operator, we've created a tiny two-dimensional 4x4 lattice, which we show on the right here. In each dimension, there are four points, and we can cross around the periodic boundary conditions to get back to where we started, a condition which we've represented here as this dashed line. The matrix represents the interaction of each of the points on the lattice with all the other points on the lattice. So for the first point, its interaction with itself is represented by the quantities in this first box, marked in gray here. If we consider the interactions of this point, the first point, with all the other points in one dimension, those will be represented by these points here. Within this smaller box that we've marked out within the larger matrix. If we consider the interaction of the first point with all the points on the lattice, this now fills out the rest of this first row. The interaction of this point with all the other points on the first row, second row, third row, and the fourth row completing the entire lattice. If we take a look at the mathematical structure of the Dirac operator, we can see that the mass term is a self-interaction. It describes the interaction of each point with itself. This is represented within our lattice, within our matrix, as a diagonal operator, which we show here. It has two elements because the Dirac spinner in two dimensions has two elements, a particle and an antiparticle, or one spin and another, however you like to think about it. The remainder of this operator represents the kinetic term, the derivative, the interaction between this site and other sites. So let's start adding that in now. The first part is the derivative with respect to this first dimension, y dimension as we show it here. And this is represented by the interaction between this point and its neighbor in the forward direction, and between this point and its neighbor in the backwards direction. Now these also have two elements, but in this case they're off diagonal, and that's because of these gamma matrices that you see here. In this case we're using the free field, so these U matrices are actually just one. In addition to these interactions between this site and the forward and backwards, we also put in the uh, transpose of this, the same interaction, but from the point of view of the other site. And those lie along this column. We can now add in the second dimension, the x dimension here. Rather than being adjacent points in the smaller box, they're now adjacent points in the larger box. So you see this second point within the box interacts with the second point within the box, but the next box over, in the forward direction and the backward direction. And once again, we see that these gamma matrices uh, appear here with off diagonal terms. In these diagrams, the blue points indicate real positive numbers, the pink points represent real negative numbers, and the green and magenta points represent imaginary numbers, positive and negative. If we consider the interaction between all the points and all the other points, then we fill in the remainder of the matrix like this. We have these yellow points along the diagonal that represent the mass term. We have these green and magenta points that lie within these smaller boxes that represent the interactions along the Y dimension. And then we have these bands in the more distant boxes that represent the derivatives with respect to the x dimension. And if you look carefully at this, you might see that there are these terms in the corners here. Why do these appear? Well, these are actually due to periodic boundary conditions. Remember this first point has a neighbor to the right here, 
whereas its neighbor to the left is actually all the way around on the other side of the matrix here. And if you look very carefully, you can see exactly the same effect within these smaller boxes because we have periodic boundaries in the y dimension as well. If we use an eigensolver to look at the spectrum of this operator, what we find is shown in the right panel here. This is simply the complex plane. The horizontal axis is real, the vertical axis is imaginary. In this case, we've set the mass term to be equal to 0.01. And so we can see we have an eigenvalue with a value of exactly 0.01 along the real axis. And then we have a bunch of other eigenvalues that are also at the real point 0.01, but have larger imaginary values going both up and down. And these have magnitudes that become quite large on the scale of the lattice here at minus one or one. The yellow points here show what would happen if we replaced the free field with a weak gauge field. You can see that this very regular pattern is sort of broken up into a more scattered pattern, but overall we see the same broad pattern. It's a vertical line uh, with a zero mode exactly here at 0 0.01. Well, what does that mean though? How should we think about it? Well, if we look at each of these eigenmodes, we classify them according to their momentum. If we look at them, we actually see that they're just sine waves in the various directions. So we look at the frequency of those waves, if we look at their momenta on the lattice, and we consider the expectation value of d dagger d uh, within that state, you can see from the continuum, we would expect this to just be the usual energy relationship, e squared equals m squared plus p squared, which is represented by this red parabola here. What we get on the lattice is actually these points, which are shown in blue here. Close to zero, this approximation is pretty good. This is why the physics actually works on the lattice. But as we get to very high momenta, we start to see the discretization errors, the problem on the lattice that we can't represent these very high energy states, these very high frequencies, because there is a cutoff. What happens instead is that the expectation value of d dagger d reaches a maximum and returns to zero. And in fact, oscillations around this point at p equals pi are indistinguishable from oscillations around this point. The physics is exactly the same. And so rather than getting the physics of a single fermion, we actually get the physics of two fermions in one dimension. But actually the problem is even worse because we have multiple dimensions in which the same effect can occur. And so what this actually results in is two to the d doubler modes, four in the case of our simple two-dimensional lattice here. So what can we do about that? We would like to get the physics of one fermion, not four fermions. So what we do is we turn the naive operator into something called the Wilson operator. The Wilson operator is a pretty simple change. You can see that the broad structure of this matrix is not really changed at all. We take the mass term and we shift it by d, where d is the dimensionality of our lattice, two in this case. And to the kinetic terms, we add these ones here. And you can see that has the effect of filling in these blocks. In the naive operator, those pieces were off diagonal. Now that entire matrix is filled in. And while that might seem like a simple change, it actually has a radical effect on the spectrum of this operator. You can see that near zero, we have the same zero mode that's at the, uh, the mass, 0 0.01. And if we use our imaginations, we can see that asymptotically close to this, we still have this vertical line where real physics, continuum-like physics is occurring. But the rest of the modes, including these uh, doubler modes that used to sit directly on top of our real physical mode here near the origin, have been flung away to very high values uh, on the real positive axis, two and, and four in the case of this one. And so those are at places where their contribution to the action is so high that these modes will no longer affect 
the physics of our lattice. They're frozen out, and only the one mode that we wanted originally is going to contribute. But of course, you can see there are also distortions of the physics. We no longer have this nice vertical line that we actually wanted. And the problem gets even worse when we consider the effects of the gauge fields. So if we look at these gold points, which is what we get if we add in a weak gauge field, you can see that the line of real physics no longer falls exactly where we thought it should be. It's actually crossing the real axis at a shifted value. This is a big problem with the Wilson operator. We actually need to tune this mass term in order to figure out where m equals zero should be. If we want a massless fermion, we need to shift this line until it lay, lies along zero on the real axis. But thankfully, these gauge fields don't really affect the position of these doublers. They're still at very high values and no longer contribute to the physics. Unfortunately, the Wilson operator badly breaks the chiral symmetry of the lattice. So one thing that we can do in order to restore it is to use something called the domain wall fermion. What we do in domain wall fermions is we introduce an additional dimension. And this is a very unusual dimension with a sort of a weird kinetic term that rather than using a gamma matrix, uses gamma five to couple the fermions between these different layers. And rather than using the ordinary fermion mass, uh, which we denote as little m, we change this to something called the domain wall height, the bulk mass, or big M5. Now, it's going to turn out later that this is going to be large and negative. That's not really important. Where does the mass of our fermion go? Well, it's actually due to the coupling between these two walls. Because what's going to happen is that due to these uh, strange chirally sensitive uh, terms, what we're going to get are two low modes a left-handed mode and a right-handed mode. But they're going to be tied to opposite walls in this extra dimension. So as we know, the mass term is actually a coupling between left and right-handed modes. So by introducing an explicit coupling between the two walls, we can reintroduce the actual mass term that we were interested in. So what's the structure of this lattice if we look at it in the same way that we looked at the naive operator and the Wilson operator? Well, in each of these little squares, you can now see there is a little copy of the original uh, Wilson operator. But we're going to replicate that one for each copy in the extra dimension. And then the coupling between these different dimensions, you can actually see, has only one term here, because of course 1 minus gamma 5 is a projection onto the... Uh, the one uh, Dirac element of the fermion, and the opposite one as we go in the opposite direction. Well, this has very radical uh, repercussions for the spectrum of this operator. Uh, rather than having uh, the zero mode very near to um, zero, we actually have these modes that completely surround uh, zero. And this is a major issue for things like Krylov subspace solvers, uh, some of which require that the real part of the eigenvalues for the entire spectrum should be positive. That condition is obviously very much violated here. And you can see if we go to a weak field, these gold points, that, uh, yeah, that doesn't really <laughs> improve things at all. Uh, so that is a quick introduction to uh, a few of the kinds of Dirac operators you will see on the lattice and their spectra.